Hi everyone, I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy journalist for over 20 years. And in addition to all of the news and questions that I like to answer, I like to bring you behind the scenes and interview some of the people who are actually generating, creating the news in the first place. And uh, today, I've got Dr. Margaret Meinkser. Is that Meinkser? Uh, it's Meinkser. Meinkser, right. Uh, from the from the Sophia telescope, which is one of my probably favorite missions out there. So who are you? What do you do? Uh, so I am the director of the Sophia Science Mission Operations Center. And so we focus on the science, collecting the science, uh, delivering the science. Um, I work <clears throat> for the United Space Research Association, which actually um, operates under contract to NASA all of Sophia science mission operations. Right, right. And I mean, I'm sure my viewers are deeply familiar with Sophia. But for anyone who isn't, what is it? Yes. Okay, so Sophia is a unique observatory. It's the only far infrared observatory in the world. Um, and what it does is it's an aircraft a SP 747. That's been outfitted with a telescope door in the back that opens and lets you observe the sky. And it flies way up into the stratosphere and it gets above 99.9% .9 of the water vapor. And that's what blocks our view to the far infrared of the universe. So by um, going up that high, we can actually see light from the universe that we can't see in any other way. In fact, it's much of the light from the universe actually comes out at this wavelength range. So it's a very critical wavelength range, but our light can see in a little beyond that. Right. And then uh, there are some ground based observatories when you think about, say, the very large telescope that views in the near infrared and the visible. Yes. And then we can think of some space telescopes, James Webb even viewing in yes. the mid infrared and the yes. near infrared. So what why is the far infrared so valuable right well um I, well, as i said much of the light from the universe comes out at this wavelength range and if you look at um the light emitted by a, a galaxy the stars emit at the visible near uv those wavelength range but if you want to look at how things are created where the gas and dust between the stars emit, you need to look in the far infrared. There's like, again, much of that radiation from the universe comes out at that wavelength because it's sort of the wavelength of creation, because you're tracing that gas and dust from which new stars are formed, from which new galaxies are formed. Uh, it's a very critical part for that reason. And then you have these critical cooling lines, these things that cool the gas such that you can condense down into things like stars. Um, and then the dust emission. So dust is like, you know, 1% of like all the mass um, in the universe, but it emits a lot because it can absorb stellar radiation very effectively and then it re-emits it and you get this huge amount of radiation um, that can tell you about what's, what's happening in the very dust and shrouded, again, where things are being created. Uh, we've been talking about in the news recently that James Webb has just gotten its MIRI instrument down to 6.4 Kelvin, just a little bit above absolute zero, which is going to allow it to properly do its observations in that mid infrared. Yes. What does it take to cool to be able to get access to that to that wavelength? Does does Sophia have to cool down its telescope similarly? Well, uh, that's a very interesting point. So Sophia does not cool its telescope. Um, you know, it's, it's in, the, it's, it's, you know, around 247 degrees Kelvin. Um, but the instruments that detect the radiation, those detectors go down to fractions above the uh, absolute zero oh. because the detectors have to be cold enough that when that radiation comes in, they can you know detect it, and it's not like the temperature of the detector itself. So we have very sophisticated cryocoolers that bring the temperature down really, really far, very you know maybe one or two degrees Kelvin or something, in order to um, see that radiation from space. Now, one of the strengths uh, that Sophia can do to get near space um, level stuff is to do very high spectral resolution spectroscopy. So you spread the light out 
really, you know, um, and, and get very fine detail of the kinematics of the gas. And this, uh, this allows you to spread out also this background. So you, you can see with great sensitivity of these high spectral resolution lines. So even though we don't cool the telescope, we have tricks of uh, high spectral resolution that really get us very close to what you could achieve uh, from a cold telescope in space with heterodyne spectroscopy. Uh, direct detection spectroscopy, uh, which uh, we also do, is limited by the, the temperature of the telescope, which is why the Takedal survey called out for like a, 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 a new space mission where you do cold, chill the telescope down to like, you know, five Kelvin so that you can see um, that radiation. You can get back to what they call the astrophysical limit. So, so you're not only cooling down the instruments, but you're cooling down the telescope as well. In the far infrared, uh, in the for, far infrared for, a yeah. future, for a future probe. But for Sophia, we do not call, chill right, the telescope. Right. We just, so, um, so it's a warm telescope, but, so, but it's a different uh, level, of, you know, different area of science that you tackle. Now, was this with the astrophysical decadal survey? Because I know the, the planetary one is, is releasing this week. Oh, it is. Oh, how exciting. <clears throat> the 19th. So tomorrow is the planetary okay. one. Um, so, so sorry, and, and, you know, I wasn't expecting this, but so the scientists, the astronomers have asked for like another airborne observatory similar Not to Sophia airborne, or a space-based one. A space. -based okay. Mission. Okay. I something see. that would do something different, uh, a different, uh, level of sensitivity right. and you could be further back, uh, in the universe. Right. I've, I've heard this thing described as, as Luvex, like taking Luvoir, oh taking right. Habex, mashing them together, and then giving it a cryo cooler to get down to be able to to make those kinds of really sensitive early well, observations. Well, actually, actually, what they did is call for a whole new fleet of great observatories. The first one being uh, Luvex, uh, but then followed on with something like this future cold far infrared telescope where you do chill the telescope. Luvex does not need to be cooled down. Yeah. All um, right. All right. Well, that's, you know, that's a whole different rabbit hole. We're talking about, a, yeah, we're we, talking we, about we, airplanes we today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so <clears throat> what is sort of like a typical observing run? How does that, how does that work? Like if you're going to take off and, and begin doing science operations, how does that typically play out over the course of a run? Yes. Well, you know, uh, we have this wonderful um, chart, Day in the Life of Sophia, where basically it starts, the plane comes in, you prep the plane, and, and you take care of the instrument that's on board. We can do one instrument at a time. Um, and uh, the crew sleeping while uh, the ground crew um, preps the airplane and uh, prepares it with, you know, fuel. They prepare it with uh, reprinting cryogens in the instruments. Um, so uh, <clears throat> this week we're using the German receiver uh, for uh, astronomy, the great instrument. It's a heterodyne instrument. And so they're, they're looking at the cryo coolers, uh, prepping the instrument. Uh, and then they have a prep where they look at the manifest, they check the airplane out. Everything is very, the safety record of Sophia is very strong. I mean, it's, it's, we have a very strong safety culture. Safety's first. Um, and then they um, have what they call a day of flight tag up where they check, okay, do we have everything in, in line? Is everything set to go? Um, and then they <clears throat> have a mission brief where they, um, that's closer to maybe a half hour before they take off where they brief what science they're gonna do, what's the weather gonna be like, um, what are the puts and takes. Uh, the flight planning for the whole flight begins 10 weeks prior to mm -hmm. settle out what targets and stuff to put in. But on the day of, um, they are implementing the flight plans and they make adjustments because of the weather. You know, just, you know, are there any tweaks that we need to do uh, to, to avoid any of that? And then they um, fly the air, airplane for about 10 hours. Um, so they take off and as they climb, uh, they start, uh, you know, adjusting things. And then during flight, they'll go look at a calibrator, they'll go look at a target. They'll switch course to look at another target and they basically do a loop around the sky. In fact, you can follow this um, on any flight tracker. You can actually follow the paths of yeah. Sophia. I, it's almost, a, it's, it's addictive. You know, you can look at it and, <laughs> and watch it uh, go around and then it comes back and lands. 
uh, and then and then they repeat the process again. And it requires that the, the Sophia team that handles this is very dedicated. They're really an amazing. It's an honor to like direct them because they're so good at what they do. And and over the course of that say ten hour observing period, roughly how many different targets is the telescope looking at? Um, I would say. Um, maybe on the order of four, but it, it, it depends on how long you want to integrate on the target. Like some targets are bright, you don't need to spend long on it. And so you can get more targets in. Some are faint and you really need to stare at it for a while to integrate. Um, the, the more time you spend on a target, uh, the more sensitive you can get on the measurements. And now you were mentioning sort of the ground operations part where the um, <clears throat> the, you know, you're, you're changing the load out, you're refueling the cryo coolers, that right. level of upgradability and adaptability has got to just make the people working with space telescopes, just so jealous, because it's always a work in progress. It's always whenever the latest greatest idea that you've got to be able to implement into the telescope and give it those upgrades. How how much of an advantage is that do you think compared to other kinds of of operations like it seems what you lack in not being in space you make up for in your ability to just change the instrument itself on the fly that that is absolutely correct um and so when sophia first started uh, let's take the great instrument for example it started it had a certain amount of capability and as time went on, they added capability. They were able to do things because technology evolved and they were able to um, go after this helium hydride line, which had never been seen before. And they had to basically oh. build a new receiver and stuff. So it's the first molecule in the universe. And they had to build a receiver for that and they were able to do that. Um, and so the instrument constantly improved and it's certainly uh, more capable than uh, the Herschel Space Observatory with its header dimension because it was able to upgrade and improve the instrument, its mapping capability. Sophia is really very capable at mapping um, the universe. And so there, the, that capability, and then just having new instruments. So we were able to juice, introduce Hawk Plus uh, in 2017. Um, and that allowed these measurements of polarized uh, light in space. And that tells us about magnetic fields in space, which is almost um, unprobed in terms of this wavelength range. So it's really created breakthroughs because we've been able to improve the instruments. And then if something breaks, you know, if something breaks in space, it's done. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a, a all modular, those reaction all, wheels. Yeah. 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 That, I mean, they, they have gone up and sent astronauts to replace big parts, but here we can do it on a daily basis. So if something breaks, we can take it off the telescope, pull it apart, fix it, put it back on. Um, and so there's a lot of flexibility, a lot of reusability. Um, and, and that is a huge advantage over space. Plus this field has so much rapid technology development. You just want to take advantage of the most recent things to push the science further. So you're right, even though we don't get into space where we have that advantage of you know the cold telescope and background, we can we can get there with high resolution spectroscopy, which is actually hard to do from space because the spectrographs are quite big. Uh, but you can do it on Sophia, and you can improve things and really, you know, get close in, in the heterodyne realm uh, to what you get in space. It it feels a bit like when I think about when I talk to scientists working with say or engineers working with James Webb or Hubble or things like that, because this thing is going to space and because feasibly, you can't deal with it anymore. The focus is on resiliency, redundancy, safety, space hardness, etc. Yes. But with with Sophia, you can kind of be more aggressive, push the boundaries of what is theoretically possible. And if you were wrong, then it's just a 10 hour flight, you can fix that instrument or come up with a new with a new idea. How do you feel that sort of philosophy changes the thinking of of the team? Uh, well, in a couple of ways, one is yeah, you can get experimental and you can try some of the latest technology without without having to have all this, if you will, margin technical margin to make sure you get it. 
Um, it also allows the instrument to be much less expensive. So by, by a factor of 10, I mean, you can build a, an instrument for Sophia that breaks new ground. Uh, we could build an instrument in the next few years if we had funding on Sophia to break completely new ground, improve mm. Sophia's performance by a factor of 10. I mean, people build, you know, drop a billion to, you know, build a whole new spacecraft <laughs> to do that. But we can do that with Sophia just with, you know, you know, $50 million sort of instrument, which is cutting edge and introduces and breaks new ground uh, in this wavelength range. And in part, it's because the technology is rapidly de uh, developing here, um, but also the um, uh, just th this wavelength range has had uh, so few observatories compared to, for example, optical that anytime you build something new, you discover something new. You improve by a factor of 10, you're going to discover a whole new uh, realm, uh, realm of science and, and facts about the, the universe that we live in and, and where things are created. So I, I think both those things play together to make this a very rich um, opportunity for people to really push the boundary and explore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it does feel like it's a little bit freeing and liberating because the the worst that's going to happen is you know it doesn't work as intended and you bring it back you pull the instrument off put a tried and true instrument back online and and you go back to to observations which is a level of of freedom that just doesn't exist for for other spacecraft engineers and right and, and i wonder oh so go ahead yeah, no, and not not only that, but I, I just to point out that because there are other ways to do this that people use balloons and stuff, but Sophia is a reliable, repeatable, and very safe environment to put in. So you can put an instrument on, test it out, like you said, take it off and tinker with it. And, you know, balloon crafts are, it, it's slower, the cadence rate's slower, and they do remarkable, like, you know, things they develop on balloons, you can then apply to more complex instrument on Sophia. And so they kind of work hand in hand. But one of the nice things about Sophia is you have this repeatable platform that's very reliable. So I'd like to talk about like what kinds of science questions Sophia is working on this observing run. I think the big discovery that we made in the last couple of years was just that there's water mixed in with the regolith across the moon, not just in the South Pole. And that was some incredible observations made by Sophia. Where, what is Sophia focusing on now? Well, you know, um, it, it, one of the wonderful things about Sophia is it covers a breadth of science. Um, and so, you know, N NASA has these basic questions of, you know, how did we get here? Um, how does the universe work? How, how are we alone? And how do we get here was translated into sort of cosmic ecosystems and Astro 2020. We do a lot of work in that area because we uh, study, for example, um, with this high resolution spectro spectroscopy, we can measure the gas dynamics and kinematics and actually understand how stars, when they're formed, give feedback to their surroundings. Um, this, uh, there's a feedback legacy program. And this is... Uh, you know, this is a key part of how star fo stars formed and how galaxies evolved over time. And Sophia is really the, the best instrument to make these measurements because we look at the cooling lines between where the stars and the, the, the natal gas is. And you can measure the kinematics. And what we've learned, surprisingly, is that it's the stellar winds. These massive stars have winds. And that is what's dominating the feedback into this gas and shredding it um, to either propagate or, de or deter the next generation of stars. Um, take the Hawk Plus instrument. That really has provided fundamental breakthroughs uh, for us because, you know, astronomy is very data-driven. And if you don't have data on something, it's kind of ignored because there's like nothing to kind of, you know, anchor it. Well, Sophia has stepped in to give measurements of magnetic fields. And magnetic fields are turned out to be incredibly important to star formation, galaxy evolution, but we have had very few measurements of the strength and the direction and the orientation. And Sophia's really have burst through on, on um, teaching us, for example, and there's this wonderful nature astronomy paper in 2020 that talked about how the gas flows in and 
is parallel to the magnetic fields and then it's paused, like it's perpendicular to the filament. And so it kind of breaks the gas. But then when the stars start forming, it actually reorients itself and funnels the gas. Huh. The magnetic fields funnel the gas to create this high density, very active um, star cluster formation. So, sorry, how do you measure a magnetic field with a telescope? Yeah. Yes, well, turns out that dust grains are not little round balls, but they're probably irregularly shaped, or you could maybe think about them as footballs, just to, to simplify it. But they have like a an ellipsoidal shape. And radiations from the star spin them, and the magnet, and and because there's iron granules and stuff in there, there's there's um, metals. Um, it creates um, kind of a an EM force that then has to align with the magnetic uh, the magnetic field. So there's an alignment factor, and then the strength of that alignment factor actually gives you the strength of the magnetic field. That's amazing. And and so they're able to take. And it's critical at these wavelengths because Sophia samples, if you will, the peak emission from dust. So you get very sensitive measurements of these magnetic fields all the way from the outside to the core where stars are forming. And that's the critical point is like, how do magnetic fields inhibit or help star formation? Uh, so that's uh, that that was quite a breakthrough in, in understanding that. And then we have another legacy program where they're mapping the magnetic fields of entire galaxies, nearby galaxies. Um, and they find that when you get into the sort of turbulent regions, either with you, if you have a merging galaxy or if there's star formation and stellar feedback, that that amplifies the magnetic field. And so this is, you know, frontline evidence of how did magnetic fields grow over cosmic time. They didn't start off very big, but they've grown through these gas dynamics and stuff. And so it's a, a fascinating. I can't wait to see all the results uh, from that, um, that survey. Um, and they also show that you have galactic winds and the magnetic fields basically funnel the gas out into the intergalactic medium. And those magnetic fields measurements were, were again made by Sophia. It's really breakthrough stuff and and roughly it's the same technique that you are you are detecting the dust and using that as as a pro like iron filings around a magnet that you're detecting the dust and that's exactly. telling you and that's showing you the strength and the direction of the magnetic fields that are present around almost anything out there yes exactly it, it's right it's because of the dust and this wavelength range can, and we make polarization measurements we have to split up the light into different polarizations of light and and can you go into a little more detail on that then i mean how does how do you detect the polarization of the of, of the light from these from these particles right so it it's uh, analogous to if you've ever owned a pair of sunglasses that are polarized and you know how you, you look at them and they really dim the light. But if you were to like switch the orientation of them, it would actually let more light through. So it's a similar type of instrument, but of course in the far infrared, the implementation is quite different. Uh, but basically there are ways that we can let one orientation of electromagnetic ration with sort of, um, sort of a grid allow one to pass and then you rotate it and you allow the other one to pass. And so you make independent measurements from the two of how much light's coming from one polarization angle, what's coming from the other. And then with those two measurements, you can solve for all sorts of what they call Stokes parameters to learn about uh, the full effect, the amount of polarization, the direction of polarization. And yeah. then from that, you ha do have to have some theoretical assumptions to then jump from those measurements to the strength of the magnetic field. And I guess that was my, my next question is what does the what does the polarization tell you? Uh, the polarization tells you um, the um, direction of the emission from the dust grain. So again, we talked about this alignment of the dust grains, like you mentioned, like iron filling filling uh, filings. So they're oriented a particular way on average in space. Uh, but then to uh, learn about that orientation, you make these polarization measurements. Um, and those polarization measurements um, are the one that give you the direction, but then how unified that direction, what percent of the emission is polarized, gives you in some sense the amount, the strength of that magnetic field. Like, you know, let's say like 
50% of the light, you know, <laughs> was polarized, that's, boy, that's a really awesome, strong magnetic field. Whereas if it's more weakly, the percent of the light being less polarized is sort of a different uh, strength of the magnetic field. Um, so I guess, you know, this is a great example, you know, this, this rabbit hole that we just went down of, of just sort of like the depth of, of the kinds of observations that that Sophia can do. What are some of the fundamental questions that are bothering astronomers that you see Sophia being able to make some fairly significant progress on? Well, um, I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> there's, um, I, there's something called a decadal survey. And they they actually did a survey and asked astronomers, what are what are your most fundamental questions? Yeah. And we went through that report and, and picked uh, a number of them that we it, there, there are a dozen of them that, that we adjust. But let me just give you let me just give you a, a couple. Uh, so there's this theme cosmic ecosystem, which is really the story of creation, how are things created? Um, so one of the things uh, that we are working on is how do gas, metals, and dust flow into and out of galaxies? Um, and that's something, for example, I was tell just telling you about this magnetic field measurement that's, you know, watching <laughs> how, how, it, how they funnel uh, the gas outside. Uh, but then what's happening in the galaxies? So you can look at galaxies at different metallicities. For example, in Chile, we did. We started this legacy program on the Large Magellanic Cloud called LMC Plus because it's measuring this very critical cooling line called carbon plus uh, emission. It's 158 microns, and it is probably the brightest cooling line in the universe of gas. Um, and we were mapping it um, in order to understand the effects uh, of high. Um, massive star stellar feedback, but also uh, the fact that the large Magellanic cloud has a lower metallicity uh, than our galaxy, uh, so our solar neighborhood, I should say. And so just understanding how this key um, line, which um, the ground-based ALMA telescope is using to probe the far reaches of the universe because it's so bright, we can actually map out where it comes from. Uh, so that's along that theme. Another one was um, how do star forming structures arise from and interact with the diffuse interstellar medium? So again, this is this feedback I was talking about, the feedback from forming these stars to what's happening around that. Uh, I talked about the magnetic fields um, in their structures. Um, and then how, do, how does gas flow from parsec scales down to the protostars in their disks? Again, we're all about that story of learning how the gas flows, where it is, what its temperature is, what its physical conditions are. Uh, we, we probe those things probably better than any other wavelength range because we have these dominant cooling lines where, with mo where most of the flux is coming out in the universe. We can image the stars that are forming as well as the gas that is helping with that formation process. Now, you explained um, this, um, this term cooling lines. Can you, can you explain yeah. this a little more deeply? What does that mean exactly? Right. So... If you think about like how we cool things on earth, right? You know, you have air conditioning units and there's a, a mechanism to cool things with, you know, these, these heat transfers. In space, everything is rarefied. And how do you cool gas? Gas can get to very high temperatures because of star irradiating it. And what happens is these, this gas, uh, which could be, you know, can hit other molecules through collisions is there a line that can emit that radiation away? So what happens with the carbon plus line is you have uh, the gas heated to a certain temperature. Um, this line um, is excited, uh, this atoms are excited, and then it releases out into space away from the cloud, this radiation at 158 micron. It does it very brightly and that cools the cloud down. Hmm. There's things that heat up, this cools it down and then you have what we call an equilibrium temperature uh, that gets established, um, but it's the cooling of the lines. Otherwise, if you couldn't cool things through this radiation, it would just go up and up and up and up. So it's like space's version of convection? Like, um, Well, no, it's not convection. It's um, collisions. Right, so it, right. It's gas colli colliding. Uh, but there is, there is sort of, well, we, I guess... Um, I guess you're right. It's convection, it's turbulence, it's gas mixing up and around. 
yeah. and carrying the heat away and carrying and shifting temperature via these collisions. But, but what, what carries the heat away, though, is the radiation. You radiate it out. So it's radiatively cooling right. the gas. Right, right, right. Okay. So it's collisionally heating up this thing, but but it's rate that in fact the collisions it's basically a temperature of the gas. And and so you're saying that that astronomers see this cooling more brightly in the large Magellanic cloud than pretty yes. much any other place. And I'm assuming that's mostly because it's close. It it well, yes, it is quite close. Um, and but it's a good example of the type of gas clouds you might see uh, in the more distant universe because the metallicity is lower. But the like the star formation in the Large Magellanic Cloud is outrageous. I mean, the biggest star forming regions yes. that we know of are located in there. Is is this a property of dwarf galaxies as opposed to the larger spiral galaxies? Uh, you know, it is. Uh, you see in some of these dwarf galaxies that you create, you know, almost globular size type super star clusters in, in these little galaxies. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting aspect of dwarf galaxies. And we're lucky to have two nearby us, the large and small Magellanic Cloud, that we can actually study those processes because these extreme star formation events really dominated at the peak of, of star formation in the universe. And here we have a, a nearby um, think place to study it. Yeah, people think like the Orion Nebula is impressive, but the Tarantula Nebula is just outrageous, like in terms yes. of scale and size, like if that was as close to Orion, that's, that's all we would see all around us. That's you are absolutely right. Um, Orion is puny <laughs> to the tarantula nebula. It's impressive because it's nearby and we can study it in detail. And the physical scale we get is amazing. And we learn a lot from Orion. But it is at a very different scale in terms of numbers of massive stars. Like it has four. The tarantula have hundreds. Of yeah. And some of the biggest stars that we even know of in the or the most massive exactly. stars we know of in the, in the universe. So you, yeah. you were sort of listing off a couple. I think we only got to two of the of the astronomer wish list. What, what else are astronomers hoping for with the decadal survey? Well, you know, there is, of course, this big theme. Are we alone? And, you know, basically worlds and suns and contexts. And Sophia is. Um, addressing those a lot with solar system observations. So, you know, one of the questions they're asking is how do habitable environments arise and evolve within the context of their planetary systems? And here you pointed out um, our amazing result of detecting water on the sunlit surface of the moon. Um, and now that that was the first paper, we, we are now, uh, I authorized uh, basically a mapping um, of the lunar surface, sparse mapping to find out where water is and how it, you know, uh, evolves, if you will, on the surface. Um, does it change with time? Um, does it change with shadowing or location? Uh, a very to, to understand, like, how did the water get there? I mean, everyone was really surprised that there was any water yeah, <laughs> on, yeah. on the surface because it should evaporate. Um, and so they're probing it with this mapping. Um, but there's also a, a recently um, executed what we call director's discretionary time observation to look at Venus. Uh, there have been reports of phosphine on Venus uh, with, with various instruments. And it's quite, a, um, it's quite controversial because, you know, how did it get there? Is it bio, biogenic? Or... So anyway, Sophia's capability with the great instrument provide, will provide the best measurement of that. Um, and uh, those data under analysis, it would be worthwhile contacting like Martin Cordner, to, who's the PI of the project at some point, um, when he when he re reveals it, maybe it'll be at the AAS, I don't know. Right, uh, right. But it'll be, it's very exciting. Again, it goes along the line of, I mean, what we can do for people studying exoplanets other places is to study our solar system in great depth. Because we have, for example, exquisitely high spectral resolution that we can measure with Sophia on nearby planets like Venus. Uh, we even make measurements of the Earth. We made oxygen one measurement of the Earth that actually can help constrain climate change models because we can isolate that certain mesosphere thermosphere region. Uh, we are making measurements of Titan with exes. Uh, we're looking at um, the giant planets with high, high spectral resolution, like a factor of 10 more than than you can achieve with James Webb again because we have a big aircraft that we can build these large spectrograph to make measurements. 
Um, and then how did water, how did the, how did we get water um, on the, on the earth? And there's some theory of comets coming and actually delivering our oceans. Um, but to do this, um, you need to make measurements of comets and compare the um, H hydrogen to deuterated version of hydrogen measuring water. And so they're doing that with Sophia. So, uh, along so with all sorry, that. I just want to clarify that then. So like the, like the water here on Earth has a certain mix of, of regular water and deuterium. And in theory, Correct. you can find objects in the inner solar system or comets that match that that recipe of water and that's that'll right. give you a sense of where the water came from. Correct. That's exact boy, that very well said, Fraser. <laughs> um that's that's exactly right. And the um the thing is that the deuterated um D to H ratio, if you will, the deuterated to regular hydrogen ratio on the Earth's oceans is very different than the sun. So we didn't on the, form... on the sun's oceans? No, not the sun's oceans, right. but just that element of a de deuterated and hydrogen is, yeah. is different than the sun. Um, and uh, the characteristics of our deuterated ratio in the Earth's oceans is different, so it's puzzling. Uh, but it could be explained if the water was made from way far out in the solar system. It just has to do with uh, the chemistry, the astrochemistry that formed it there. Um, and then um, when you measure comets, we find that uh, there's been one or two comets measured with SOFIA, and we actually find that uh, the D to H ratio, deuterium to hydrogen ratio, is the same in that comet as it is in the Earth's oceans. Now, you know, this is like one comet. You probably want hundreds of them to really, you know, set this straight. But it's, it's clear that there can be some evidence, and so you can address this critical question of, like, how did Earth get its oceans, which is important because mm -hmm. it might inform us, for example, I mean, we're in this Goldilocks zone, but, you know, natively, we shouldn't have an ocean. But of course, we need an ocean to have have life. And so there's this this put and take on it. But then how do you get that ocean? And and here huh. the theory that but it needs really you know detailed follow up. It's you know, it's a it's a conceptual theory to show that. It, yes, indeed, that that is how these rocky planets get oceans and hence have life. That's really interesting. I mean, the, I mean, and the, the theory that Earth had gotten its oceans from comets is possibly one of the most long standing ones. But I think that's as close and as far as it, you know, comets have a lot of water, Earth has a lot of water, therefore, Earth must have gotten its water from from comets. And then right. But then people have thought about other mechanisms like, oh, well, the sun, solar wind could be interacting with grains, oxygen rich grains in the environment. And then that created water and that was delivered directly, etc. But now you can actually measure the recipe, the water recipe of all of these different places to find the one that gives you the most earth like. Yes, exactly. Which is a fascinating way to, to approach it. And so it turns out the comet idea is strengthening again. Exactly. No, exactly. And you know, you want to base things on evidence and Sophia can collect that evidence with it with its instruments. Oh, incredible. Um, what? Uh, what comes next? Do you think? I mean, it feel it feels like Sophia is such a such a successful mission experiment. Could it be like another could could that platform that idea be scaled up to like another oh. observatory has anyone been thinking about what Sophia 2 looks like you know we're we're kind of midway through Sophia 1 and we're uh really really just working hard to make this the most scientifically productive um observatory and i can tell you over the last three years, we have doubled annual publication rates. The science is just really pouring out now. Um, and so we really want to continue on this path of producing this really high quality science, getting people more involved in, in using this unique wavelength range, this unique observatory uh, to delve into these mysteries of the universe. You know, funding aside, we, we could operate Sophia for another 10, 15 years. You know, we, 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 we could do that. Um, and I, I think that's where where my focus is. Um, the Astro 2020 um, decadal actually um, suggests doing something in space 
again, it's a, you know, Sophia looks at um, the nearby universe we, we studied in exquisite detail. Um, but if you could do like a, a telescope that was chilled and put into space, um, then that gives you a whole realm that you can look at fainter things in the more distant universe. So I suspect that's probably the next step for the field, just because you, again, you'll get this discovery space of, you know, a factor of a hundred um, from what we've known. And that, I think it, there's some excitement to go there. And then maybe 30 years down the road, um, people are talking of having basically another great observatory uh, where you have like a James Webb, but imagine James Webb chilled to like five Kelvin. Um, and then with that, um, and with a, a whole suite of instruments, you can just really knock out a huge amount of science. And so that's where I think the next steps for the field may be. And so, but Sophia is really critical to have now until we get those future opportunities because it is the only far infrared observatory in the world. But I, um, I, I guess what I'm getting at is that I think like thinking of giant space telescopes that can do take the science to the next level is fantastic and important. But I think that misses kind of the, the fundamental nature of of what Sophia is really bringing to the table is this idea of iteration, this idea yeah. of upgrade, this idea of experiment of being able to push the envelope. And you're limited to the fuselage of a 747 and in terms of the size of your telescope what is it like uh, four meters is that how big is the telescope uh the, it's two and a half meters. two and a half meters yeah so, yeah. so two and a half meter telescope flying near the edge of space is a phenomenal observatory with all of its you know ability to track on objects and so on but but it feels to me you know if i was running nasa you know which i'm not as a canadian apparently they won't let me um <laughs> that that there is a role for this this experimental platform that sits in between the ground based observatories and the big space future big space based observatories that the lessons are learned flight after flight after flight by both the astronomers working with these instruments and learning how they behave and being able to swap them out while there's still a chance to do it but that as the space telescopes get bigger the right. need to to prepare your experiments to test out your ideas has to increase to a certain extent as well. So is there a and so when I talk about Sophia too, I'm not talking about a space telescope, I'm talking about a wow. better platform for serving this, this experimentation role within NASA. Wow. Um, I, you know, you're, you're going to get, you're going to put me to the drawing books. I think on that, I, I know there was, uh, we had uh, a series of workshops on sort of future instrumentation for Sophia. And uh, as you um, may know, um, Sophia is a partnership between NASA and DLR, which is the German space agency. And uh, in Germany, they, they also held some workshop, but they made it broader, like looking at that. And they did talk about sort of future types of, you know, space, sorry, airborne type things um, that I, I don't know if they could be bigger, but th there was some discussion um, of that, of like, what could you follow on Sophia uh, with it, with the future? So there's a little bit of thinking on it, uh, but a lot of people, because there's this huge sensitivity advantage at this wavelength range, and when you go into space and chill it, there's just uh, a huge curiosity in that direction. And I think that's why I've been uh, mentioning that as a uh, potentially the next step at this wavelength range. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm going to take your suggestion back, mention that, you know, sure. we have, <laughs> we have some public interest about, well, you know, once Sophia is, you know, put to bed, what would be the next, I mean, would you build a, bit, a bigger aircraft? Um, I, I don't think NASA would, I think they would have to retrofit something that was bigger. Yeah. I mean, I'm imagining like, like what if you took a, a 747 and put two of them in the fuselage side by side and try to build a, an interferometer out of it? Or what if you, Oh, wow. You know, what if you, um, like made a super guppy version of a 747 that would have right. a blob in the back that you could, that you could park a bigger, a bigger telescope. But I, but I guess that's, that's it. I mean, you know, again, the advocacy that I would be making is that, that without this, <clears throat> without this technology, without this platform in the middle that you can kind of channel, uh, people into to work with and really get to know their instruments, all those all that learning, all that iteration, then 
are lessons that that can be quickly worked out before they get baked into space telescopes that fly out to L2 that can never be touched again, right? right? And I, yeah. and I and I wouldn't, I don't know, I wouldn't underemphasize how much of a difference that's making to the far infrared astronomical community, I, the, I the pathfinders. Yes, yes, I think you're right. I think this platform does offer a lot of pathfinding um, aspects to it because you can experiment, use the latest, improve upon things and stuff. I, you know, your interferometry idea is very intriguing. Uh, I have a friend who works on interferometers. I, I'm going to run that by him. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not an astronomer, just a journalist. Yes. Yeah. So just keep that in mind. Um, I'm sure there's some really key, uh, you know, Fourier transform uh, reasons why it's a it's a difficult thing to to work on. Yes. Yes. Um, but uh, Margaret, it's been absolutely a pleasure to to talk with you today and sort of see the future. And again, I'm I'm a huge fan of Sophia. I know I'm supposed to have some kind of journalistic integrity and and uh, not pick favorites, but Sophia is definitely on my on my list of favorites. So thank you for oh, all of the science sure. that you guys have been doing, and good luck with this with this run. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank right. you very much. Thank you for your time and curiosity. And I if people it. want to track what you're doing, what you're working on, and sort of keep tabs on the airplane, uh, what's the best way to do that? Well, we have um, a website, uh, the Sophia website. So if you just Google Sophia, S-O-F-I-A, now you have to do an astronomy, right? Because there are lots of Sophias out there. Yep. You'll get a um, city. You'll get right a city or or some act actresses and stuff. But yes, if you do Sophia and astronomy or NASA, uh, you'll pop up at their site. And we have um, a constantly running thing of, of stories. There's also our NASA blog uh, where we post our stories. So if you want to be up to date with, with the latest, we have blog posts on um, on Chile, uh, as well as the science uh, recent science results coming out. We just had this wonderful spotlight on the magnetic fields in bones of the galaxy, which is uh, these long um, galactic filaments. Uh, so those are great um, areas. And then uh, Soraya um, puts press releases out on the USRA website as well. So I think all those locations um, are great um, avenues to learn about the latest with Sophia. And then there's um, trackers. Um, so if you ever want to, uh, we fly four times a week. Um, and, you know, there are these flight trackers. I think FlightAware is one that I like to follow. And you put NASA 747 in there and you'll you'll get to follow Sophia as it flies. We fly at night. So, you know, um, that's that's the routing. But it's um, it's fun to watch. That's awesome. All right. Well, again, thank you so much and good luck with the mission and uh, keep the science flowing. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. And, All right. Uh, Take care. Fraser, I, I just wanted to say that once you get the interview published, could you just send us a copy or let us know what the link is? Yeah, well, it's actually live. So it just happened. OK. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks. So you have a link somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I'll send it to you in a second. Thank you. All right. Thank you so All much. Right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone.